just said, I'm, uh, I'm deputising for Professor Greenwood this morning. Um, the reason that uh, Professor Greenwood asked me to step in is that uh, the Advanced Reporting Centre works uh, across all the TRL levels through our spoke network, and Warwick University is the electrical energy storage spoke for the Advanced Reporting Centre. And what the Advanced Reporting Centre does is we fund mainly late TRL research programmes. Uh, so we have £50 million pounds of government funding every year to, uh, to allocate to late stage research programmes. But we also work very closely with colleagues at EPSRC and Innovate to make sure that we have programmes coming through all levels of, uh, of development. Um, so we're very keen to support the university network to bring the fundamental science that we're so good at here and bring it to the marketplace so that the automotive sector can adopt it. Um, my role at the APC is to coordinate those activities across all of the, uh, all of the different uh, universities and industrial partners for each of the technologies that we support. So that's electric machines, batteries uh, and uh, other energy storage systems, power electronics, internal combustion engines and also digital engineering toolkits. So uh, I work very closely with Dave on the work that I'm going to take you through today and, and certainly we can help support you guys in any projects that you might have that uh, you think fit with the, uh, the automotive sector agenda. Okay, so that's enough of a, a plug for the APC. I'll move on to, uh, to some, uh, some background about where the automotive industry is. So, right now the automotive sector in the UK is in rude health. Um, we're producing about 1.7 million cars a year. That's growing at about 8% a year. So that means we're producing a car about every 17 seconds at the moment. So it's a really high volume, uh, high growth industry uh, that employs a lot of people, creates a lot of wealth, um, and also creates a lot of exports. And the main exports beyond just the cars themselves are engines. We produce 2.5 million engines a year, uh, of which about 60% are exported. So that's about 1.5 million engines a year that we export. A significant number of those are diesel engines. So uh, with the challenges that the sector's been facing in recent months, um, a couple of years now, I guess, uh, it's important that we understand what the next generation technologies are that are coming along. It's also true that we have a strong supply chain in the UK. So about 40% of the content of a car is made here in the UK. Um, if we get into the subsystem level, it becomes less than that, and that's a challenge that we definitely want to address. And as we're seeing this drive towards electrification, one of the key things that uh, we want to make sure of as we, as we go through uh, a transition from internal combustion engine focused vehicles into battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles uh, is that we increase that UK content. So we want to work with supply chain partners, we want to make sure that they understand the technologies that are coming through, and also develop differentiated manufacturing processes that give us a competitive advantage here. So it's really important that not only is the work that we do focused on the technologies of batteries, motors, power electronics, etc., but it's also focused on the manufacturing process requirements uh, that deliver those technologies to the marketplace. So why is electric vehicles so important? Well, I'm sure you've all seen in the press the growth, the, the headlines that are coming out, people like Volvo saying that they're going to have all of their cars electrified by 2020. Now, let's be very clear what that means. That means that they will be hybrids, not all battery electric vehicles by that point. But no, no matter what the statement really means, we're seeing a sea change in the industry. Electric vehicles are coming, they're coming fast, they're coming in many different forms and shapes, and they're coming from everywhere. So it's not just the traditional manufacturers that are delivering these. We've seen Tesla come, we see people like Detroit Electric. All of these guys are coming to the market as disruptors. So the sector is going through significant levels of change. The key element of that is, is going to be the battery, the battery itself, because the battery is a key, uh, key enabler for the technology to move forward. So what we really see there is that battery technologies are a key um, driver for the success and the uptake of electric vehicles. What it does do, though, is create that supply chain opportunity, not just for batteries, but motors, power electronics, and ancillary devices. So we want to make sure that we've got all of those in the UK and that we can offer complete system-level solutions because one of the key things is actually optimization at a system level. We've had over 100 years of optimizing uh, internal combustion engines and powertrains that go with them. Um, they're extremely efficient. They're extremely low, uh, cost-effective to manufacture. They are easy to make in high volume. They're easy to transport. They're safe. They're easy to refuel. All of these are the challenges that we face to, uh, to uh, address and make sure that we can achieve if we're going to get consumer buy-in to this drive towards electrification. So, um, where does the UK stand in this? The UK is actually, from a European perspective, a leader. The, the, the Nissan plant in Sunderland 
is the largest producer of electric vehicles at the moment. It has the largest battery uh, production plant in Europe at the moment. Um, so we are in a great position. What we need to make sure that we do is as this market grows, and it is growing very quickly, that we remain in that leading position. And that comes from the fundamental science right through to the production readiness. So, um, I think this covers why batteries are going to be the key enabler for that. So what we're really doing here is saying that in terms of all of the key uh, characteristics of an electric vehicle, they're going to be defined currently by the battery technology. So the range will be set, the cost will be set, the power will be set, the lifetime of the vehicle, currently 15 years, can we make that a battery, can we make a battery pack that's going to last 15 years right now? Ride and handling with the weight distribution of the battery pack, the, the six to 900 kilos of batteries in some of these vehicles, it's a significant challenge, and of course packaging all of those batteries as well. So if they're going to be successful, the key enabler is to make sure that the battery technology is fit and function in a way that the consumer wants to use um, uh, 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 its vehicle today. <coughs> We're making great progress. So lithium-ion batteries are likely to be the technology for the next decade and we're making significant improvements and uh, they're moving forward very quickly. So we've seen pack costs drop to about a quarter of where they were eight years ago. We've seen um, volumetric density double in the last 15 years, which really means that range is starting to become uh, less of a challenge, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we still need to make sure that we're making breakthroughs in these areas to, to move the, the, the technologies forward. As I've said, the batteries are the most expensive part of the vehicle. So if you take a, a traditional vehicle, about 50% was the overall cost of the powertrain. Um, if we take uh, a battery system, it's about five times the cost of an engine. Whereas motors and electronics, depending on whose numbers you take, is somewhere between 60 and 100% of the cost of, a, of an engine. So we're adding a significant chunk of, of cost into the vehicle <coughs> manufacturing and value for, it, for the product. What we need to make sure that we're doing there is, is maximising the opportunity, therefore, for the UK. So, if we're making 1.7 million cars now, growing towards 2.1 million cars by 2020, 2022, uh, that's a significant opportunity. If only 50% by 2035 of that number have got batteries in them, and the battery pack cost is about £6,000, then that's still somewhere between 5 and $6 billion a year of revenue that the, the UK can create. If we can manage to export these battery packs, or certainly significant parts of those battery packs, the European opportunity is 50 billion. So this is a significant market a year. Um, and there's no reason we can't do that. We have, as I've said, a leadership position. We started to, to, to do this. The UK government and industry and the academic community have started to work together. We recognise that it's not a single um, piece of the puzzle that will make all of this work. So absolutely we need world-class factory research, and I'll talk significantly more about that in a minute. But we also need to make sure that we understand how to turn that research into product and make those products at high volume here in the UK. And once we've done that and put them into cars, we need to make sure that those cars can be driven around and it's convenient to recharge, that they're easy to use, so we need an infrastructure that will allow that vehicle to be uh, used every day by typical um, family who wants to run a single car. Because these cars aren't going to be currently going to be any cheaper than those vehicles that are out there. So that means that the R&D community needs to work very closely with the manufacturing community to deliver volume solutions and also work with the energy sector, which is a completely different uh, approach to today. Our energy uh, challenge for electric vehicles brings it much closer to that energy source that is required by homes, general public um, and factories to, to, to run. So, Whereas if we've had an independent fuel source with diesel and petrol that's used and created specifically for the transport sector at the moment, we've become much more integrated with the energy sector. That offers challenges, and we've all seen the headlines in the last couple of weeks of you can't plug your EV in and use your kettle. Nonsense. But, equally, when we start to scale the volume of these vehicles up, it is going to become a local grid challenge. Or we could become part of the solution. And that's really something that we need to be thinking about right now as the volumes are starting to grow. So if we, if we look at the bit that you guys perhaps are more interested in, the world-class battery research that we want to make sure that we have here, what we've tried to do with the, the programmes that have been introduced by government is to make sure that it's an integrated programme from the lowest TRL level through EPSRC, through Proof of Concept at Innovate UK, 
and into production readiness, which is what the APC is, uh, is here for. This in a little bit more detail. There's the Faraday Institution, which is looking at the fundamental science part. There is the Feasibility Study and Research and Development Programme, which is focused upon proof of concept. And then there's the National Battery Manufacturing Development Centre, which is going to be uh, a facility that will allow you to produce battery chemistries of different types in a flexible production solution, but representing a, gigawatt, a gigafactory. So you'll be able to produce over a gigawatt hour of these battery, battery cell chemistries. And it is focused on cells and modules, not packs. So pack assembly we see going into automotive uh, OEMs as something that they'll do as part of their uh, vehicle manufacturing facility. So we're really focused on that front end of what's the right cell chemistry, what's the right cell geometry, what's the right module solution, how do we integrate all of that, and be ready to put them into packs when we get them to the vehicle uh, manufacturers. The programme itself was launched... Um, on the 21st of April. It's £246 million pounds of government investment, which is going to be match funded in some of the areas that we're talking about, so it's a significantly larger number than that. It's over four years, so it's a really quick investment that the government wants to make sure that we take leadership now rather than let the market drift and become, um, become fragmented. So it's a challenging spend, it's a challenging uh, resource commitment from universities, from, from industry, to make sure that this works. But this has been done completely in conjunction with the automotive sector. The guys at the automotive OEMs and the tier one suppliers are absolutely aligned with working closely with academia and with smaller companies to make sure that we bring that solution to the UK, and we want to do it now. What we're trying to do with the Faraday Institution, or the Faraday Challenge, sorry, is to make sure that we take full advantage of vehicle electrification. It's definitely coming. Everybody is now talking about 50% of the fleet being electrified by 2035. What we need to do as a key element of that, for all the reasons I've just explained, is make sure that we are world leading in battery development and manufacturing. So we need to make sure that all of those things are pinned here in the UK. Looking a bit more at the structure of the Faraday Challenge, it's coming from the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund which is the £4 billion government uh, uh, drive to make sure that we are world leading in manufacturing and, and, and engineering. And it was one of the very first programmes, in fact it was the first programme that was funded by the ISCF. That's the importance that's been placed on it by UK government. £246 million over the four years as I've mentioned, broken down as I've said, and we've already identified some key areas that we want to focus the programme on. So in terms of the fundamental science, degradation, multi-scale modelling, recycling and solid state batteries, programs are already being asked, asked to be bid into. So those programs are, are, are launched now. There will be also the Faraday Institution, which is going to be uh, an ac academically focused uh, coordinating body that will support this program for both those four activities and those that will come later. So this is meant to kick off a, a additional programs through 2018, 19 and 20 to make sure that people are getting a full opportunity to bring all of these research. Perfect time. Won't you feel like I'm not, I was boring you. <laughs> um, so we want to make sure that we bring the whole breadth of research community to the table, and we want to engage people that perhaps currently aren't playing in the automotive sector to come and work with us. So that's both industrial partners and academic, uh, academic research communities. In terms of Innovate's programme, um, we have some short-term feasibility study programmes. Are the technologies likely to move forward? It's something that we're really starting to move uh, at a pace with now in the, in the funding, body, uh, funding body world where we're starting to look at let's do some exploratory work to find out if these technologies really do have value and then push them forward as quickly as we can. They're also looking at the traditional CR&D, sort of TRL 3 to 6 uh, proof of concept work, uh, but also interestingly looking at business models. What are the different business models that are going to come along with the, with the technologies that we're talking about here? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, for, our, for our part, um, we're building a big shed. We're trying to make sure that we've got the right technology into a single facility that can become a, a centre for manufacturing process development and understanding how chemistries can be scaled from, from lab scale very quickly into production volume rates. So what are the challenges we're trying to address? Well, what we've done in the last six months, and I hope some of you guys were involved, if not, I could certainly come back and talk to you more about what we did and how we did it is we've taken an industry consensus about what the electrical energy storage market needs or the, the automotive sector needs from the electrical energy storage solutions that it, that it requires. And that's come out through a set of consensus roadmaps. You can find the roadmaps for this and uh, motors, batteries, power electronics, 
engines and digital systems all on the APC website. And they give a 25 year horizon of what technologies the industry sees as important. Now, we can debate the accuracy of the content of the, of the roadmap very specifically to, to great depth, and hopefully we can come back and talk to you all about that, and we'd love to do it. But the key is it's a consensus roadmap. That means that is the whole of industry and academia engaged in saying, we might not agree with all the points, but as a consensus, that's what we believe the future looks like. That enables the government to invest in the right places. So these are the technologies that we see being important for the next 25 years for the for automotive sector, and that's global automotive sector. And we've had global OEMs input into these roadmaps, so it's not just a UK parochial vision. That is a global vision. And we could summarise that very easily into the challenges that are facing the Faraday challenge, uh, or the, the, the initial challenges that we've put into the Faraday challenge. <coughs> cost. Automotive industry, it's all cost. Cells, batteries are an extremely high part of the bill of materials that we've just talked about. Cost is a key driver. How do we get from $280 per kilowatt hour as a PAT level right now to $100 per kilowatt hour at a PAT level in 2035? Because that's what's going to take mainstream production forward. How do we improve energy density? How do we improve power density? Safety is a key challenge. People are already starting to see, we've all seen the images of the Tesla going up in Norway, battery control systems, uh, fires that you can't necessarily control, people talking of stories about just keep pouring water on it until it's gone out because there's nothing more you can do. It's a key challenge as, in, as the general public gets more aware of battery systems and more aware of the challenges around battery systems, we need to have the answers in place. In terms of first life, vehicles currently are manufactured to last 15 years, 150,000 miles or thereabouts, and often last much longer. The key challenge is whether a pack, a battery pack, could survive that long and still be giving a range that is reasonable for, a, for, the, for the user to accept. We believe that currently that's about eight years, and so we need to almost double it. Industry, again, has been very uh, broad in its application of its technologies, so a vehicle is built to run everywhere in the world. And that means that they have to be able to uh, be resilient to temperatures of minus 20 and up to plus 60 to be driven in deserts and in ice fields. Battery technologies are not necessarily um, able to do that right now. So that's something, again, that we want to be able to improve without building significant systems in there that add cost, weight and space, take space from the vehicle. Predictability, and most, probably most importantly, is recyclability. So there's a significant challenge, I'll talk a little bit more again about this in a while. Um, the end of life vehicle directive has been in place for at least a decade in the auto industry. That requires 95% of the vehicle by mass to be recycled or reused. Um, currently, batteries are exempt from that. As we scale batteries into high vo higher volume vehicles and become more a, a proportion of the production fleet, they're going to be brought into that legislation. So recycling of batteries is going to be a key challenge. As I mentioned, we don't just want it to be about the final solution. We want to make sure that we're engaging all of the aspects of the supply chain in the process of building battery packs and uh, bringing electric vehicles to market. So we've already started to engage with the raw material suppliers and, and, and actually from an APC perspective we've started to talk to people like Campbell and School of Mines, Royal, Royal uh, Geological Society, as well as organisations like Cornish Lithium to understand what the potential for, for these materials are. And one of the key challenges is actually understanding what the, what the materials are going to be that are required in the next 10 years. The mining community takes about 10 years to put mine into, into action, sustainably anyway. Um, they are very nervous about what the re material requirements are for the whole of the electric vehicle powertrain solution. So there's rare earth materials for, for magnets, but um, there's equally there's the lithium challenge. Not that there isn't enough lithium out there, just potentially there isn't enough capacity to dig it out of the ground quickly enough for when we need it. Also, there's the tramp elements like cobalt. Currently, that's dug out as a secondary element from a major, major mine that's doing something else. The amounts that we're going to require need to go and find this individually open those mines and find a cost-effective way to get that out of the ground when something else isn't coming with it. So th there's a real challenge around materials, but also the manufacturing processes in between that and the production of the vehicle, they're new to the automotive sector. So again, we've built supply chains that are very integrated, very structured, from component supplier through subsystem supplier into integrator and then into the vehicle itself. 
None of that exists for, auto, for electric vehicles and none of that exists for batteries right now. So that's a real opportunity and challenge. So engaging with the chemical industry to help us to bring the materials to a point where we can use them. What cell manufacturing geometries do we need? How much of a fixed asset is a cell manufacturing facility? Does that mean that once we've built a factory, we're going to be using that technology for 10 years? Because if it does, we need to understand that. How do we build them into modules and packs? So that's more of a mechanical systems thing, but there's still a, a mechatronics challenge around all of that. And certainly what we want to do is make sure that we take full advantage of the latest automation, smart factory technologies as we bring those things to market. Into vehicles, uh, so I think we've probably heard JLR have said all of their vehicles will also have electrification in the next two or three years. That's a range of 25 vehicles. We've got to work out how, they, how the packs, the cells, the geometries, the control systems all work across those 25 different vehicles which are all meant to have different characteristics, different features, different performance characteristics. Uh, uh, operating uh, systems and, and, and requirements. So all of that becomes a significant challenge, but then this challenge at the end of recycling, and uh, I think I'll talk about it in a minute, but, um, but yeah, that one is, is, is coming at the, at the automotive sector like a freight train. So what will we do to get there? As I said, I think short to medium term, it's recognised in the industry that probably the next 10 years is lithium. But there's still lots of work to do in lithium, and that's really about how far can we extend the lifetime of that. Because if we're going to put manufacturing facilities in, a typical uh, LG factory to make uh, 100,000 vehicles worth of batteries is about 300 million. Once you've made that investment, you're not going to want to turn it off, turn it off after five years. You're going to want to keep using it. Um, so what are the key breakthroughs that we can make in that space? What, that's the challenge to you guys. Is what, are the, what are the solutions that come with lithium-ion that we could really start to improve the chemistries? Equally, if we're looking longer term, what are the future chemistries? Is it sodium? Is it lithium sulfur? Is it lithium metal anodes? If it is, what are the implications for manufacturing and development and production? And if we can know them as soon as possible, we can start to make sure that we can um, bring, bring those technologies to market at the same time as the chemistries are ready. I'll tell you now, from my background, I did 20 years in the steel industry. The longest time frame of the introduction of a new material is the testing and proving out of that material in a vehicle platform and the production readiness of that material. So working on those now is a real key challenge. In terms of cells, uh, we're seeing lots of different formats. Cylinders, pouch, prismatics. Energy density is all, how do we get most, most out of the space that we've got in the car? So that's really, again, a challenge for you guys. Can we bring in people that understand packing, packing uh, solutions? Can we start to look at different, or more flexible geometries for batteries that allow us to do different things in a, in a, in a different way? Um, how do we make sure that they're all joined together in the right way and it's consistent? We're talking about lots of different batteries in lots and lots of different packs, all needing testing. Can we start to integrate more, more into the cell? So, cooling is a key challenge. Thermal, thermal energy uh, from, a, from a, the whole of the electric vehicle powertrain um, challenge is, is a problem. Nobody can have the same cooling system, nobody can integrate a different a, a consistent temperatures, all of those things really need to be solved. I mean, a Range Rover at the moment has eight radiators at the front. We don't want to be building more and more of those radiators in because we have more and more cooling systems running at different, different performance characteristics. So we need to start to bring all of that together. We also need to make sure that this safety issue is, is addressed and, and put to bed before it ever becomes an issue. So making sure that they're safe with fire suppression systems or, or integrated solutions into the batteries that mean that they can't ever set off and have a thermal event is something that's really important. And then BMS. Is BMS going to become distributed? Is it going to become integrated with more, more of the power electronic solutions? What are the answers there around how we build that into a single solution? Uh, in terms of uh, modules and packs, again, disassembly, recyclability, <coughs> cooling, welding, end of life is a real key. And uh, one of the things that came to, uh, came up to me recently was um, People are starting to think about using second life batteries for, for grid storage or, or, or energy storage at home. A key challenge will be those packs won't necessarily all be produced from the same place and they won't all have the same chemistries, they won't all have the same BMS, they all won't have the same um, performance characteristics. How are we going to integrate those into a single solution that you can put into the house or the building or the grid uh, and make sure that they're still working safely and, and performing efficiently to make it cost effective? Because some numbers I was looking at only last night suggest that we're going to have an awful lot of packs coming out of the market in about 20 years' time. 
and only about a fifth of those packs are going to get used for this at the moment. So the more interesting we can make it to that market segment, the better. In terms of pack, it's a significant part of the car. We've already talked about the value of that part. So we need to make sure that we understand how to optimise it for efficiency. There's, there's likely to be some um, push from the industry to make sure that these things become part of the structural performance of the vehicle. There's significant weight that's, that's in there. We need it to do more than just carry batteries. We need it to take some of the crash load, give some of the stiffness to the vehicle, um, make sure it's really starting to, uh, to perform as a, as a part of a whole system, not just as an independent box that we bolt to the vehicle. Vehicles will change though. And one of the key challenges and one of the key messages that we're certainly trying to get out there right now is you don't need 600 miles of range. Nobody on earth sits in their car for 600 miles without needing a pee. So, so what is the real range that we really need to get out of these batteries and how can we optimise to deliver that? Because at the moment they're being scaled, particularly people like Tesla are scaling these batteries for 5% of the market and it's, it's quadrupling the cost of the battery, um, which is already significantly high. If we can start to get the message out there that actually, as that graph shows at the top, about 90% of the journeys are less than 100 miles. So if you've got 100 miles range and you can charge at the end of it, that's great. In fact, it's 50 miles, sorry. It's 100 miles total in the day. Um, then, then actually, if we scale battery packs for 100 miles, it becomes a lot more cost effective. They get mass market uh, adoption much quicker. But that's a, that's a messaging thing. But there is still a challenge for you guys to push that range further and make those battery packs smaller. Because obviously making the battery packs more reduces cost, gives us more space, and does all the great things that we like to do in terms of package efficiency for a car. Particularly as we're seeing smaller cars. L7 cars, small vehicles, we're seeing these pods, particularly pods uh, around connected autonomous vehicles, which is the next bullet point. Transport solutions are changing, and uh, I think it comes into the next point as well, business models are changing. So it used to be that everybody wanted to own their car, and it was a real uh, status symbol thing to own the nicest car you could own. What we've already seen is a lot of people now lease their car. They might not recognise it, but they don't ever buy their car. They own it for three years and then they give it back. So that's the first change to come. But what we're already seeing with, with organisations like Uber is actually next generation may never own a car. They may just use service, uh, uh, mobility as a service. And that would just be call the car up when you want it, call the type of car you want up when you need it. So two-seater to get you to the office, uh, six-seater with luggage space to get you, to ho get you on holiday. You'll just call that up and it will turn up at your door. That pre presents a, a, another set of challenges because right now, I'll take myself as an example, I get in my car in the morning, I drive four miles to work, it takes six minutes, I park it there, I stay for 12 hours, I do the same journey home. So my car does 12 minutes in 12 and a half hours. If it's not owned by you, no vehicle operator is ever going to run it for, what is that, 12 minutes out of 12 hours, that's a 60th of its, of its potential. They're going to want to increase that 10, 15% utilisation to 85, 90% utilisation. That requires fast charging, that requires a battery pack that will last a million miles, not 150,000 miles. That requires a whole different set of performance parameters to the ones that we're considering right now. In terms of charging and infrastructure, the quicker we can charge these things, the better. What people want to be able to do is to charge them like they fill their car right now. Turn up at a petrol station five minutes later, you drive away with 600 miles of range. That's how it works today. And there's 25 pumps at a service station on a, on a, pet, on a uh, motorway forecourt. If we're trying to charge a 60 kilowatt battery pack for 25 cars in five minutes, that sounds like an awful lot of energy to me. So managing that energy, figuring out how we can do that, what's the realistic solution for this? Is, is a real challenge. Um, and of course it affects the chemistry of the batteries as well. So we're going for rapid charging with long, long, longevity. How do we deliver that? Because um, nobody's going to accept charging a Tesla for 12 hours to get half a vehicle, uh, half its range back out of a 30 amp socket. So, that, so home charging is, is absolutely important, but we need to make sure that home charging is still practical, sensible, and the battery chemistries are going to have 15 year, 150,000 mile life, and potentially 10 times that in the not too distant future with that kind of charging rate. So recycling, I've talked an awful lot about recycling. 95 gigawatt hours, 150 million tonnes of batteries at about 1,000 pounds a tonne of disposal cost is where we potentially are um, by 2025. Somebody solves that problem, they're going to be very wealthy very quickly. 
Um, so that's, that's something that we need a significant amount of effort to look at. Okay, so we've done a lot of great work in the labs. We've worked with you guys at the, at the research, in the research community. We've delivered the point of proof of concept. <laughs> and we'll, uh, so what do we do next? We need scale up facilities, and that's really what the part of the, uh, the fund that the APC is delivering. We've got great facilities already. And what I don't want anyone in the room to forget is while APC is investing in the facility, it still has a significant amount of money every year, 50 million pounds, that can be invested in the technology development to bring those technologies to maturity. That's not going away. Plants themselves, they cost, well, if you take Tesla's Gigafactory, $3.5 billion. Europe needs 12. Um, so there's lots of capacity space, lots of growth opportunity. We need to make sure we understand what is the most efficient way to put these batteries together from a cell point of view, a module point of view, and of course a pack point of view. So the one elephant in the room that I've not talked about is skills. We recognise there's an enormous skills gap right now at all levels of the industry. So um, from, a, from a, a, an academic perspective, graduate numbers have had dropped off. I'm not sure where they are today, but they had dropped off in terms of electrical engineering, electrical chemical engineering. Uh, just at the time when the industry needs tens of thousands of people. So at the moment, there's believed to be a 30,000 person gap in Germany. It's, it's less in the UK, but it's still a very significant gap. And that needs to be addressed very quickly. So bringing through new people is great, but we also need to reskill traditional engineering people, uh, engineers. We also need to reskill not just the engineers, but the, the people that are working in the manufacturing facilities, in the garages, the forecourts, and all the after sales part. So it's an enormous skills challenge. And right now, we don't have, don't have a clear answer, but we're, we're starting to try and figure out how we address it. And then the opportunity, of course, is bigger than just automotive. So we've already talked about energy storage at home, energy storage for the grid. Uh, there's also marine, aerospace, and rail sectors that really should be able to take advantage of the technologies that we're bringing through. So that was Faraday. That's £246 million, and that's the next four years. What goes beyond that? Well, I've talked a little bit about the APC network of spokes. So we want to make sure that we've got world-class communities. We want to be able to go out to... Toyota, to Honda, to Tesla, and explain why, why they should do their research and development in the UK. And actually, it's not about the money. They're wealthy companies, they can invest in R&D, they do, and they invest significantly more in R&D than we're talking about, even with the Faraday Challenge. But what they don't have is the skill set, the community, the networking, and the range of capability that we have in the UK that we're starting to connect. So I encourage everybody in this room to come and support the Spoke Network and, and, and help us to grow the breadth of technology and capability that we can, we can demonstrate at events across the globe to, uh, to potential partners. And one way you can do that and be, be more visible to the key players in the automotive sector, including the OEMs, both nationally and internationally, is to get involved in our, uh, our portal. And the portal is basically a database that brings together commercial opportunities. So a company can look for a partner to build a commercial uh, project where they supply parts to, to a battery pack, to a motor, to a power electronic system, but also research and development. So we're expecting this to be used to put challenges out there to the research community that, that we hope you guys can start to consider how to address. So please, again, come on to talk to me or uh, come onto the APC website, register yourselves on the portal, get involved, because, if, again, the more people we can bring together to meet this challenge, the better. And finally, we want to make sure that we're delivering integrated systems. So I've talked a lot about batteries, and that's the reason I'm here. But there's motors, power electronics, and all the other things that go around this vehicle system. Hybrids are going to be a key player. Engines aren't going away. So what we need to understand is how all of those systems work together. And what we've built with a program called Muster is a networked uh, set of test facilities across the UK that can very quickly demonstrate the performance of a piece of technology as part of a hybrid powertrain. So you can take a physical entity, test it locally, <coughs> and build a set of models around it that will demonstrate how it performs as a hybrid powertrain. But because we've networked the, the, uh, the test facilities, you can actually bring four or five physical pieces of technology together and test them all as an integrated solution. So all of a sudden, people kludging together new powertrain solutions into the front of a Range Rover that it's not suited for, with bits of technology stuck on it that don't work or aren't correct for its performance characteristics goes away. We take cost out, we take time out, 
and that should give the UK competitive advantage. So please take advantage of that. The universities are, are, are the six spokes, uh, so Warwick would be the lead for elect electrical energy storage. Talk to the guys, talk to me, um, and we can introduce you to the people in those networks that allow you to test your facilities much more quickly as part of an overall system. And I think that's me. Oh, sorry, I've been a bit long.